Hello everyone and welcome to War of the Stars, a Star Wars podcast. Coming to you as always from deep within the Outer Rim, far beyond the watchful eyes of the Galactic Empire. My name is John Mark Tolly, and the gentleman giving me the weird look earlier to over there is, of course, my co-host. Garrett K. Jones. How's it going, everybody? And I'm Brian Kress. I'm here to present the people of the Empire. Yes, yes. Um, anyway, uh, well, today we got, gentlemen, we are continuing our journey through the Star Wars movie library uh, with, I would would you, would you say it's safe to say that before the sequel trilogy came out, that this would have been considered the most unpopular Star Wars movie. It certainly is in my office. I don't know. I mean, I mean, it was for the most part, it was fairly uh, fairly popular when it mm -hmm. first came out because it was the newest Star Wars movie. Yeah, but, that's all we had. You know, it, right. Um, yeah. but I mean, I I. I liked it. Um, I thought it was fun and it gave, I mean, I'll be honest. The dialogue is probably the worst of, oh, yeah. the, of the prequel trilogy by far. Um, but I will say that looking back on it, it is probably not nearly as bad as some of the stuff that we've, as far as writing is concerned and dialogue is concerned, mm -hmm. it's not nearly as bad as some of the more recent stuff I've seen. Mm. And I'm not just talking about Star Wars. I'm talking about other projects as well. But there's some, Indeed. there's definitely some, some cringeworthy dialogue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this was the first, um, we'll just jump right into it, but this was the first movie that, you know, after watching it several times and, that it was the first movie where I began to question things. I began to question like character motives. And, you know, first of all, let's take Anakin, for example. It's obvious from the very beginning that he has the hots for Padme. Why in the world would you then send this hormonal 20 something year old on this mission to this romantic location to protect this hot print, hot senator that you know he's basically hot for. Why? And why was Padme not putting the, the brakes on that too? Like she should have. Like this is totally inappropriate. Well, I mean, yeah, that that there's so many questions with that because like. Like at this point, Padme did nothing to dissuade Anakin. Um, <laughs> and no, no, although no, no, fair, if anything, it was the opposite. Fair. To be fair, uh, my ex wife was eight years older than me. I started dating her originally when I was 18 and she was 26. But did and you meet her when you were nine? No. Okay. <laughs> I met her when I was 18. I think you make a fair point, but I also think I do. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. no, I... go ahead. I was just going to say before we go too far down the rabbit hole of the Padme Anakin thing, I too began questioning things in this film. First off, I began questioning George Lucas. But most importantly, this is my favorite attempted assassination in all of science fiction mm. the floating droid, lasers a hole in Padme's window. Now you've got a clear shot at your target. Let's put two giant worms in through the like. Why not stick a gun through that hole and shoot her? Like, or you know that meme of like the assassin trying to kill the assassin, trying to kill the assassin, trying to just sitting there in the in the in the pews. Like this is what that was. Like Django Fett was hired. He passes it off to. Uh, the changeling the changeling mm -hmm. passes it off to the droid the droid passes it off to the worms oh that's what funny. the crap i hadn't thought of that 
I, the only yeah. thing I can think is that, like, at some point, somebody said, well, we don't want them to know it's an assassination. Oh, because cohone worms just naturally occur in senators' hotel rooms? Like, of course someone's going to know they went in there. Also, oh, the hole in the window. Well, That's then, all. here's, I here's to another to factor to that, is that, like, th we're talking about a senator who has been known for the last 10 years to use body doubles everywhere mm -hmm. she goes, including during her stint as a queen at the age of 14. Including her stint as an English uh, soccer player. Also, yes. Bend it like Beckham joke. Okay, sorry. I <laughs> love it. But, like, she uses these body doubles. Nobody bothers to do, like, like a slash and burn thing on the whole platform. Why just blow up the one ship? Blow up everything just to make sure. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think it's safe to say it's a good thing that Garrett is not an assassin. Or so we hope. I cannot c confirm or deny any activities within the uh, the airspace of Coruscant. I do like this. I like this movie for the world building. I like. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a Senate guy. I like seeing the Senate interplay. I love watching Jar Jar Binks manipulated into um, granting Palpatine power. That the, poor bastard. The the standing joke though, and, it, and it's it's hack. It's easy to go for, but I'm going to go ahead and go for it. Is Patton, uh, Natalie Portman is a fine actress. I mean, she is an amazing actress. And Hayden Christensen, not at the time so much, but has become an excellent actor. But oh. neither of them is credible as being attracted to the other when they're in the same room. Yeah, and that's a yeah. problem for me throughout the trilogy. I believe that they're in love only when they cannot make eye contact. Put them in the same room, and it's all about sand and you know flirting with the force and oranges. It doesn't. It doesn't work for me. And the, the snide thing I always said was, if you can't convince me that you're in love with Natalie Portman, you, you are not an actor. So, you know, not, not to not to badmouth Hayden over much. He does he does a great, great work and he's amazing. And Kenobi and like, again, he's he's aged into it. But at the time, like this callow youth thing just didn't work for me. He ended up just being just being, a you know, the, the joke is Manic and Skywalker. I, I just didn't believe him through most of this movie. No. And, you know? and part of that has to do with with the direction from George Lucas. I mean, granted. Say, I mean, say what you will about the performances. The mm -hmm. like the performance. Oh, you mean uh, faster, their, more intense? Well, he didn't even do it that time. This time around, like it wasn't faster, more intense. Actually, the dialogue in in throughout the 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 prequel trilogy was actually much slower. Um, there, yeah. there was not nearly like the. You look at the dialogue in, um, uh, in the original film, and it's. It's snappy. It's snappy really better. Yeah. Yeah. This one, like through with the, the prequel, like Phantom Menace, when we were talking about it last month, like the Phantom Menace is a little bit more mellow as far as like how things are delivered. There's urgency when there needs to be urgency, but there's there's a slower pace when there needs to be. With Attack of the Clones, it's like George Lucas dialed back that intensity even more. Mm -hmm. And the only like the most intense scene we get is Anakin's breakdown over having killed the sand people mm -hmm. and jumping back on, on the whole train about, uh, about Padme not pushing back against Anakin's advances. Like if that wasn't a red flag at all, I don't know what else. Oh. It's like, she's been like, I, I, I love the, I love the meat. I'm going to step away. <laughs> I love I love the the meme of this. Uh, it shows the scene where they're in the dinner they're in the dinner um, thing, and he's using the force to float the apple, and she's smiling, and it shows her under un, hand underneath the table, pressing the panic button. Smashing the panic button. <laughs> I'd like to see a different version of this story where Padme stays with him because she is terrified, because she, he when he confesses to her this breakdown, yeah, he's sad about it, he regrets it, but he still butchered a dozen sentient beings because he didn't like something yeah. they did. And this is, this guy is a demigod. Like you cannot do anything to him. Once, once Anakin decides something is going to happen, you have to be a Jedi to stop it. And Kenobi didn't even do that good of a job. So I will, if I'm I will, in this situation, how do you break up with that guy? Yeah, I will say, I will say this. At a distance. I've gone on record as saying that. Dear Anakin. Um, episode two.
it was my least favorite movie in, in the Star Wars movie. And that's Same. not to say I don't like it, but it's yeah, if I'm to rank him, it's probably my least favorite. However, it has one of my favorite scenes in Star Wars, and that is the moment when Sh- Shmi dies right before Anakin slaughters the Tusken Raiders. Just the look, that look of pain going to going to ang- fear, you know, if he lost his mother, what's going to happen now, to anger to the dark side, to pure rage. And it's all in the eyes and all takes place in just a few seconds. And I it's agree. one of my favorite scenes I, that Hayden's ever I, done. I, that is just, I, I mean, no words, no dialogue, just facial expression going from, like I said, from um, just, you know, grief to fear. He goes through all the emotions of the dark side. I, that's a really good point, Mark. I, I, I got to give him credit for that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You can really see him flexing that skill later on in Little Italy. Oh, sorry. I forgot. I'm the only person who saw that movie. But yeah, Little Italy is a, is a great Hayden Christensen movie from the post yeah. Star Wars era. I, I think you're right. Christensen shows hints of that depth of emotion. But then he yells about sand, and then he like that whole yeah. and, and and again, you know, like I mean, you take a look at the the script. I mean, while like going at and looking at the the original trilogy, you look at the dialogue for A New Hope, and you've got some depth there. You've got some good dialogue there, but the dialogue gets gets amplified in Empire Strikes Back, and, and again, it gets amplified in. Um, Return of the Jedi because it had a different writer. The prequels have the yeah. same yeah. screenwriter for all three of them. And while I will give credit where it's due to Lucas developing the world building and developing the story, he is garbage when it comes to writing decent dialogue because nobody talks like that. Exactly. Like, real exactly. characters well, don't talk like that. And I... I said this before i think one of the problems with um when you when you get to the the prequel trilogy compared to the sequel trilogy is when when george wrote a new hope and wrote the original star wars he was still relatively unknown so he had people that could push back and like "Eh, really when he wrote this when he wrote the prequels he was george lucas creator of star wars and he had a bunch of people in there that either were afraid to or just wouldn't tell him, George, that's not a good idea. Right. <laughs> that's that's kind of dumb. We shouldn't put that is in it, there. Is, is it, and is it as a result? Film? Is it Steve film? No, it's Lucas film, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think he even kind of said that, you know, eventually he said like, he, yeah, you know, there basically there's too many yes men around him that would just give in to whatever he's wanting and be like, sure, George, that's an amazing idea. I don't know. I feel like I he probably enjoyed it at the time. I, I don't buy a lot of what George Lucas says in in the present about things in the past. I will say that yeah. he I it does have one of my favorite moments in the trilogy, despite also I agree with you, Mark. It's my least favorite film in Star Wars. Um I, I would I would rather watch Attack of the Clones than almost any non-Star Wars movie, but I would rather watch any Star Wars movie rather than Attack of the Clones. So like it's it's still up there. It's Star Wars, but it's it's down there as far as within Star Wars. That said, Yoda with a lightsaber, guys. Am I right? Like that's a great Dude, scene. I'm, like, I'm, see, I'm the opposite. Me, man. I that is my least favorite. Oh really? That is my least favorite. Tell I tell me about okay, that. I, I'm let here. me ask you. Let me ask you this question. If you take that, first of all, you take that lightsaber fight out, does it change anything about the movie? Well, no, but I mean... Secondly, sec- to me, this was just the ILM guys going, look what we can do. And to me, it takes away from when you see the fight between Yoda and Palpatine at the end of episode three. I would have rather have waited for that scene for that. That to be the moment when Yoda finally pulls out his lightsaber. It's to stop the ultimate evil, to try and stop the I, ultimate evil of Palpatine. I I would say that Yoda fighting 
Darth Tyrannus does prevent the death of Anakin and Kenobi. I, I think that see, that's see, this, this is how I would have played how I would have done that scene. I would have started just the way it started with and with with uh Tyrannus Dooku having the chair having the stare down, you know. And you tease that he's going to pull that Yoda's going to pull the lightsaber because you know it looks like Tyrannus is going to either. But then before he does, then he pull he pulls down the statue. Yoda has to stop it, and Tyrannus gets away. And then you fast forward to episode three, where you finally get the reveal of Yoda pulling the lightsaber. Okay. Because in the long run, I don't think it did anything for the for the overall story. There was I... nothing that came after it that like other than saying like oh. Dooku used to be used to be Yoda's Yoda's um, student. That's never never followed up up with on episode three. It's just a throwy piece of dialogue that's just like, oh yeah, they used to used to be his his mentor, his master. Yoda used to be his master. He was this last Padawan. Yeah, yeah. But nothing I mean, ever comes of it. Isn't everybody kind of Yoda's Padawan? I, I feel like that there's well, there's not. For me, there's not a lot of emotional depth there. Garrett, what do you think about so, that fight? I'm interested. Uh, with re- with regards to the fight, I think I, I think John's right that having if like if we were to remove that whole sequence after like after Dooku takes down uh, Kenobi and Anakin, I I like had it ended and all he does is he just flies off in his ship and goes back to Coruscant. I think that would have been a, a perfectly fine ending. Because yeah. it still would have ended with that that um, with Anakin being dismembered. It still would have ended with um, the way it, it does. Um, and I think it would make for a much more dramatic reveal for, for Yoda to know what his fighting style is like. However, however, because we only see Yoda as far as like cinematically, in two lightsaber duels, two major lightsaber duels. It's this one with uh, with Dooku and the other one with Palpatine at uh, at the end of Revenge of the Sith. It actually is a great setup because it shows the audience what Yoda is capable of and how he belies that. My my first thought um, later on, it it kind of made a, a some sense to me, is that for anyone who's ever studied martial arts. The teacher never fully tells all of their secrets or all of their skills. There's something that they hold back from showing to their student because it's that one thing that they have that should the student turn on them, they have that ace up their sleeve. And the Sith are, are no strangers to that mentality. No, yeah, they wrote the book on that, yeah. But, yeah. The, uh, but the thing that I'm thinking of is that if you guys have ever seen the movie The Prestige, uh, mm-hmm. there's a char- he's a he's a tertiary character, but there's this this Chinese magician, and every time people see him out in public, he looks like a feeble old man. And the the final trick that he does is making this gigantic glass goldfish bowl appear as if out of thin air, and the only thing he's doing is waving a a handkerchief around. What he's really doing is the entire show, and as he's walking out or into the theater, he acts like an old man, and he's actually holding it pressed between his knees to give him that that shuffle of being an old man, and he's carrying that weight the entire time. The only time he drops the act is when he is in his private moments. And Yoda does something very similar. Yoda is a very strong, very capable character. But what he allows people to see and what he allows people to underestimate is his size and his abilities and his skills. The fact that he has gone centuries with very few lightsaber duels is pretty spectacular Mm -hmm. because he's kind of trying to live as much of the motto or the creed of of the Jedi as possible. I got to say, it's been a thousand years since anyone was willing to cross sabers with Yoda. Like, I'm sure he did some practicing, but. He went centuries without a lightsaber duel because he went centuries without an opponent. I don't. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure he gets a lot of credit for that. Right, but that's my point. Is that there's there's this mystique that's built up about it. They're like because even Anakin makes a comment that he's he's probably a better uh, swordsman than than Yoda. Mm. That he could beat Master Yoda and and, and uh, Obi Wan's 
Obi Wan's you know mentality is that only in your mind, young Padawan. Right. All right. But, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's actually it makes for a decent setup because yeah. when you look at the landscape of the fight that takes place later on in Revenge of the Sith, that fight is all over the place. It is mm-hmm. a huge open air arena where Yoda is literally having to use all of his force ability, all of his all of his physical energy to dodge every attack that Palpatine is making. And all yeah. and it's all about foot footing, uh, foot placement, and it's all about balance as far as what he's doing. And so, in the enclosed space that he has in the inside that hangar bay in Episode Two against Dooku, he has the upper hand. He's he's faster than Dooku, mm-hmm. but and, and because Dooku's using an older archaic style, but against Sidious, who is using all sorts of trickery that that Dooku doesn't even think about using other than to be a distraction. It is like, I, I, I think it's a good setup. It just could, it could have been executed maybe a little bit better. That's all. I'm in the minority. Yeah. I got that. I love yeah. that fight. And and perhaps because I don't have the level of respect for Yoda that, that some viewers do, but I, I can see both your points. I, I think it's, that's well said, John. I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have expected that level of disdain for it, but I, I can. I, it's not the. It's not a disdain. It's just if I'm if I'm ranking the the all the lightsaber battles that we have, that's going to be down near the bottom. That I, raises the question: What what's your favorite? Ooh. Mm-hmm. Tough pick, I know. Mm-hmm. I would have to live action. I would. Oh, have no, to anything. Say, my favorite's a cartoon. I want to hear what, oh. you, what your favorite is. Oh, if we're going anything, um, and just from the story, the story, the story buildup and the whole buildup, <laughs> even though it, there's it's only a few seconds long, that's uh, Obi Wan and Maul at the end of Rebels. Classic Bushido Samurai. Yes, showdown. I love that one. If we're talking live action, just one pass. Even though, even though it's it's flippy and very cinematic, I still love. Uh, Anakin versus Obi Wan at the end of Episode Three. That that's just a great. That, that, that is just, that is low yeah. hanging fruit for that year. That's um, a, a, an easy. Pick. I mean, I, I like most of them. I I really do like Luke versus Vader. Uh, Which at, time? At, uh, Jedi. Vader is a straight up horror movie villain in that one. I, I agree. Yeah. Garrett, what, what's your favorite lightsaber battle? Um. I mean, it, I, as far as live action, it's it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Like I love the changing landscape of of the fight between Obi Wan and Anakin because mm-hmm. because it it changes so drastically from being going from being outdoors to being indoors to being outdoors again. That is the um, hardest Mario level I ever saw in a movie. Yeah, right. Um, but. Piggybacking off of what John said, um, Duel of the Fates with with uh, Maul, Kenobi, and Qui Gon, balanced by the fight at the end of Rebels, um, and the mm. reason being is because if you look at the, the the cinematography of both of those fights, especially between at the end between Obi Wan and, and Maul in Phantom Menace, and at the end of Rebels. Maul goes into the same technique because he sees the same kind of stance that and the same kind of like placid mm-hmm. demeanor that Obi Wan that that uh, Qui Gon used originally that Obi Wan begins to mirror. The difference is he's not seeing it from Obi Wan's perspective because Obi Wan saw how that fight went down, how and how it ended for his master. And he's not going to repeat the same mistakes. Mm-hmm. He has those years to study and 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 form a, a a defense against it. But if you look, the same maneuver that uh, Maul used to um, to blindside Qui Gon, where he smacks him in the face with the the hilt of his saber, and then run and then twists and runs him through. That is exactly what. Uh, what he tries to do with Kenobi in Rebels, he goes for that that punch 
but because yeah. Kenobi had seen that before, instead of blocking the same way that Qui Gon did, he actually goes for the slice and ends up yeah cutting through the saber and killing Maul. Now, you, if we're oh, sorry, I uh, I saw that too. Do you, do you think Maul wanted to die in that in that moment? I don't Maul know. Goes through more I don't, suffering than almost any character we see in Star Wars. I don't I, think it was intentional, but I think at the end he was at peace. Yeah, I agree. I I sort yeah. of thought it was a little bit of you know you've heard the phrase suicide um, by cop. Really for... Maul's like I Sorry. wanted. I'm I'm done fighting. I just want it to be over. But he doesn't know how to give up. All right. he can do is fight. But I think by using the same style against Kenobi, knowing Kenobi's going to be prepped for it, I think Maul kind of went there planning not to come back. Yeah. But that's just that's just headcanon. I, I have no screen evidence for that. Now, if we're talking newer Star Wars, um, as far as favorite, I really, and this I might be the minority about this, I really liked the two fights that we saw between Obi-Wan and Vader in the Obi-Wan series. I, I like the first one. I like the fact that, that Vader just wiped the floor with him. Like, I, like you, I know, just, you, agree just, you, you can think about it. For, if, if you look at it from Obi-Wan's point of view, he's seeing the person that he hasn't seen in, you know, at this point, several years. And he's this monster now. He really he finally finds out that Anakin is still alive and this monster is Anakin. Okay. And... But then, then you turn around at the end of it and just the emotion of, you know, Vader first trying to toy with him, but then Obi-Wan just completely overpowering him. And I the emotion that... on that scene when he cuts when he cuts the mask off and you see Hayden's face, that was just an emotion. That was probably the best part of that of that series was that fight, that scene. And you know, hearing kind of hearing him call him dark over and over again. Yeah, that that seat when Vader's pushing him down into the fire, your pain has just begun, Obi Wan. And the dialogue in that whole and you know from the beginning when Kenobi says, "What have you become? I am what you made me." Unbelievable. But yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That's an interesting. That fight is really interesting too because it's in the dark in a dusty setting, and we kind of see for the first time the drawback of your main weapon being a melee weapon that is in your face and blindingly bright. Yeah, you know, Kenobi, he can't see past his lightsaber. Well, yeah. uh, we've kind of got off the topic. Of, ah, sorry, uh, yeah, so, we, I, I took us off that that route there, but um, I did yeah, want to say okay, my favorite, okay. favorite yeah, fight is, is the here. Sidious versus Savage Press and Maul in, in Rebels. But but back to back to the batter hand. You're right. Um, um, well, we were just talking about Obi Wan. Um, I found it, it really Obi Wan's arc in this show in this movie to be pretty interesting of him being the investigator of investigating there and you see you know the this is the first this is the first time where you really see the the I don't want to say the tendrils but you know how deep the entry the, the um the Jedi you know, are into you know all everyday society. You know, you see Obi Wan going into this diner, which I thought that was that was aw that was hilarious. That there's a old school diner on Coruscant. Diner. I love <laughs> it. Yeah, that was great. That that's George Lucas, so like right there being like, let's see. Well, we already did the race. We did the race. We tried, we tried to get a Hard Rock Cafe logo in there, but they wouldn't let him do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then you know, seeing seeing the you know the the spying and the espionage of him trying to sneak in and figure out what's going on, and the fact that Dooku straight up tells him that a Dark Lord of the Sith is controlling the Sith, his even tells him his Darth names, his Darth Sidious. <laughs> He's controlling at the top. He does everything but say, "Dude." <laughs> <laughs> the guy who's chancellor, yeah, right. Um, but there's yeah, an interesting uh... line in the rise and fall of the Galactic Empire. There's there's a really cutting line that they observe that Palpatine's uh, fame and and prevalence, his his existing power, kept him off the Jedi radar. They're looking for someone who wants to take over the galaxy. They're not looking for someone who already has. 
Mm. I did like the scenes on uh, Camino. I think that was really interesting to see a little bit more into the clone industry, as it were. Yeah. And I, I love the idea that. of friendly, pleasant, polite aliens that do not have your best interest at heart. You mm -hmm. can't read these guys. You're like, they're all so nice and pleasant, but none of them want him well, to find out. And the other thing is that most of the uh, most of the Caminos, like, I mean, you have to get into the canon of it, but the, the Caminoans, they, they were, uh, they had actually bred out in, um, emotion from from their gene pool and so it was it was a co completely foreign concept to them because it allowed them the the objectivity of being able to do what they were doing despite whatever horrors it led to yeah it, until you uh, obviously yeah. we get, you get to the uh, end of or the start of uh, bad batch and we meet omega but yeah. there's some there's some change there because um because obviously, uh, what was it Nala say? Yeah, she yeah. Uh, she uh, developed a uh, at least a, I guess an ownership or a, or a responsibility for Omega and wanted to, to care for her uh, in in her mm -hmm. way. But like, yeah, I, I see. I wanted I for me, I wanted to know more about Camino because I mean, obviously, we've got cloners, but like what was our society like prior to all of that? Like, like mm -hmm. how did when their did culture raining? Yeah. Right. Um, it's like the Pacific Northwest without the just just say, welcome to space Seattle. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The, well, in uh, that in how does an entire planet get lost and no one notices it? You delete. It's like a, this seems, this, this, this didn't file. seem, this didn't seem, I mean, but but this didn't seem like a a backwater primitive society. Like I could see, you know, someone deleting indoor and no one batting an eye because, well, there's nothing on indoor. Plan to have anyway. But you know, Camino looked like you know when you look at it, it seems like a very advanced society. They uh, they know that the republic exists. They you know they seem to you know understand that. That the Jedi exist, but yet, you know, but yet no one says like, "Wait a minute, wasn't there a planet there?" I think it speaks so, to the Republic at large's reliance on data rather than this, empirical yeah. observation, and and like well, the 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 pleasant well, well, if it's not in the files, it does it must not be there. Like that's not how it works. That that's like if you yeah. delete a picture off your phone, and like, oh, I I lost that picture. I guess that dog never existed. Like it's not yeah. a. They, they just they I have no picture I have no pictures of Chicago on my phone therefore Chicago doesn't exist. Have you heard the theory that St like was it St. Louis or Des Moines Des Moines doesn't really exist? <laughs> no, I've heard Wyoming. I've never exist. been there so it couldn't possibly exist. But I've do you heard know Wyoming, Wyoming and Delaware, Delaware both don't exist? <laughs> That's right up there with birds aren't real. They're not. They're all uh they're all uh cameras. But yes. check this out. So here's the thing is that See, I can kind of understand where where they're coming from because, like, if you look at here's here's Coruscant right here. If you guys are able to follow along with what where I'm at, so this is these are the core. Okay, yeah. Although I, I dare say that Coruscant should be closer to the galactic center, mm -hmm. given how it's the capital. But whatever, this is I, I'm pulling this off of Reddit, so who knows who's who's updated it? But I mean, all these are different hyperspace lanes and stuff like that. But you look at where. Camino is right over here. And yeah. Camino is not far from Tatooine, not far from Ryloth, but it is it's not exactly on any kind of major hyperspace lane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's easy for it being on the the outer rim, almost near the furthest part of the outer rim yeah. to go you know, uh, unnoticed if it seems to just disappear. Now it's weird to think that of looking out how close it is to Bothawi, which is where all those Bothan spies are from. Although we've never seen a Bothan spy, so we don't know what they look like. <laughs> they never come back from any mission. Nobody ever. No, they them. don't. Yeah. Um, but like, like we can. I mean, it's weird that even the Bothans wouldn't know what that is, and I'm sure there are Bothan Jedi at some point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there is. Uh, oh shoot. What story was that? 
There, there is one that we meet one. But go on, come back to me. Right, but like I mean, you can see here, like all these, all these different planets that that we've encountered uh, throughout throughout the series. I mean, Sereno, this is where you know Dooku's from, right over here, and it's not very far from Yavin or Dathomir. But then, oh, yeah. you know, over here we've got Bakura, which is where we had the truce of Bakura, and it's not far from Endor or. Uh, Batu, which I believe that's the planet that Galaxy's Edge is supposed to take place on. Yeah, yeah. And of course, here we have Seoul, South Korea, that somehow managed to make it into the Star Wars galaxy despite something. I don't know. Yeah, I see Exocol, the uh, the Sith planet up there. Yeah. Yep, right up here. Yep. And there's Ilum. Interesting how how Ilum and Exegol. Anyway, are so close to each other. What is galactically speaking? Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Or Jedha for that matter, which was named after a Jedi temple. Yeah. Huh. yeah. It's always interesting to me to, to, me to see maps of Star Wars because if, if I if I like to I like to observe to, for people that. Um, the Millennium Falcon travels from Hoth to Bespin at sublight speed because their hyperdrive isn't working. Like, how close are these planets? Interstellar travel, they should have been 50 years old when they got there. Anyway. Um, I did I really like the, the Kaminoan culture. I I like I like seeing the, you know, all the clones, all the little bitty mini fets, you know, training, all that stuff. I don't like what they did with Django Fett. And while I really love Timora Morrison's work, I think it... I've, I've kind of had enough of his voice coming out of those helmets. Like, I think they, they kind of really lean too heavily on him. He's, he's like the Oompa Loompa in the new Willy Wonka. Like, it just mm. it's too, it's too much, you know? Um, I would have liked to have seen more of those, more of how he bought the clones. Like, or show me Sifo Diaz. You know, they, I'd like to see that stuff. And the show don't tell. But um, overall, I think yeah. that the romance between Padme and Anakin really overshadows most of that movie. You asked someone about Attack of the Clones. They're nine times out of ten, I think, they're going to complain about Anakin and Padme. They're not going to talk well, about Jack. And, and, and the thing is, it could have been like, they, I think, big monsters. I think the film was mistitled because you, I, I mean, like, the clones don't literally attack until the very end of the, of the film. And the only things that they're attacking are robots. Right. The better title would have been Star Wars: The Clone Wars, or Star Wars. Clone Wars hey, there's Man. clones now, <laughs> right? It was um, it was a bit yeah. of a letdown, you know. Ever since the line in, in A New Hope, when Kenobi mentions the Clone Wars, that's a fascinating concept. Tell me more. Oh, don't tell me so much. Yeah, yeah. Although I will say, I did, you know, I did like the the. Uh, it was interesting to see Obi Wan in the fight scene with Jango. Because it's interesting Listen, to see we you know, a Jedi fighting against a non-lightsaber wielding opponent. That who's was, doing okay too. That's a really good point. Yeah, and it gave it me gave gave one of the best sounds in cinema history. That boom, boom. That yeah. that sonic that the sonic bomb. That what is that? The the front? <laughs> oh. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I uh, when we I was saw never a Star Wars gamer, but I know that that came out of a that, yeah. The, that uh, in, uh, was was the first it? active, was, uh, first active use of dubstep to destroy something before dubstep became a thing. Yes, good. <laughs> Looking at you, Man of um, Steel. Shots fired. Seismic <laughs> charge. Yes, yeah. seismic charges. Yeah. Um, although it is followed up by one of the cheesiest lines of dialogue, this side of I hate, I love Sam, and, which is uh, Boba Fett going, yeah, get him, Dad. No. You know, I or something like something like that. He, yeah, he's just kind of like. Uh, but then again, you look at it, and you're like, okay, he's supposed to be like a, a nine to ten year old kid, nine to ten year old. Yeah, 
and we saw how well that worked nine. seeing Darth Vader when he was nine. Like I really would have preferred to never see that happen. We don't need we don't need to see Darth Vader or Boba Fett or Hannibal Lecter for that matter as a child. And none of that is necessary. Yeah. Yeah. It just it just takes away. I, I enjoy the Clone Wars episode where um Asajj Ventress gets the better of young Boba Fett and locks him in a box. And that's always fun to, to dwell on. I, I have a complicated relationship with Boba Fett. Don't don't mind me. Yeah. Overall, oh, I, do I, 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 I stand by my initial statement that Attack of the Clones is my least favorite Star Wars movie. Um, yeah. I, I do like the Yoda fight. I do like seeing Kamino. And um, I, I kind of like the scenes in Coruscant. You know, I, I'd like to see, maybe not more in the movie, but I would like to see more of an episode of a show where we actually see like the nightlife of Coruscant. That death stick dealer, you know, pop pop quiz. What's the name of the death stick dealer? Do you remember him? Um, Sleezano, uh, Sleaze Bagano. Yeah, Elon Sleaze Bagano. I I wrote a whole joke about how it was like actually pronounced differently, but like they anglicized it when he when the the family emigrated to Coruscant, and like they were actually like legitimate you know pharmacists, but like every everybody calls them sleaze bags. Like, All right, fine, we'll just be drug dealers. <laughs> but um, I, I think I think that's pretty fun too, and it's nice to see Kenobi sort of in a in a drive by do gooding. Like you, I, I like to think he saved that guy's life and like turned yeah. his life around. And I do, I do, I do enjoy the the speeder chase. I do, I do enjoy that banter between because that's the first time where you really see that banter between Obi Wan and Anakin as they are flying through. Uh, Coruscant on the speeders, and I think Brian froze up on us. Uh, you there, Brian? I'm. I, I just want to do um, this now. Okay. I'm totally imitating him. This is what I got. <laughs> <laughs> we joke because we love. <laughs> we do. Oh. We do. Oh, oh, he popped out. All right. Um, he might be back. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, the um, the speeder chase through Coruscant. Um, that that was a lot of fun. Um, just seeing the frustration that Obi Wan has with it, with Anakin at this point. Uh, yeah, anyone, so anyone who's like, ever been just... a teacher uh, who had a very difficult student, I completely understand that. Yeah, and the fact that you, you can tell by his reaction that this isn't the first time that Anakin has done something like this. No, like it's not like Anakin. What are you doing? Is like not a. It's a, oh god, yeah, and see, you know, I mean, you expect that of like, like a young teenager, not of someone who's like eighteen or nineteen years old who still hasn't figured out, hey, I probably shouldn't do stupid stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. but we see how that mentality kind of carries out throughout the rest of the Clone Wars, as well as into Revenge of the Sith. And yeah, so. um. Well, I mean, what what are some other? Have we missed anything we're talking about? No, um, I think we pretty. I, we I, well, I mean, the only thing I would say is what kind of a letter grade? Like, like uh, if you were to give this like you know a rating out of like I don't know five stars or whatever ten stars, what would you give it? Um. Out of um, I would give it out of five. Out of five, I would give it. Two and a half seismic charges. <laughs> two and a half seismic charges just to make sure it's dead. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah, um, I just, uh, Brian just text just sent a. Facebook message his. Uh, his internet died, so we will carry oh, on. Oh no! Um, Curse the oh, internet. Yeah. To quote the great Darth Vader, "No." Sorry. Oh no. 
Oh no. Um. Anyway, well. Um. I, I personally, I like. I would. I would be generous and give it at least a three because. Yeah. Yeah. While it's what, uh, uh, while it's my least favorite of the prequels, hands down, I like it far better than most of what we got in the sequel trilogy. Hmm. Would you would you say that it is it's safe to say that this is is ironic that it's the second movie of, of the of the prequel of the of the prequel trilogy that episode two is the middle child of the Star Wars movies? It kind of gets forgotten because you have you have episode one that had you know, for all its flaws, you had the great fight scene between, you know, with Maul and the double ability lightsaber. Everyone loves that. Everyone seems to really enjoy episode three. Then you get into the original trilogy and episode two just kind of is like there. Yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. Brian. Sorry about that, gentlemen. Well, we are just wrapping up. Thank guys for thanks for coming by. Probably better off. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we are just doing our letter grades for um, our our scores for um, episode two. I gave it two and a half seismic charges. Um, <laughs> but no, and but I after thinking, hearing what Garrett said, I think I'd have to upgrade it to at least a three. Out of how many? Um, and I made the comment, kind of half jokingly of looking at episode two as the middle, you know, ironically being the second movie, the middle child of the Star Wars movies. It kind of gets forgotten. It's just kind of there. Um, There's, and it shouldn't be. There's, there are iconic, there are moments that should be iconic. The killing of the mm -hmm. sand people, the the budding romance between Anakin and Padme. It, it just, it falls way too flat for me. It's, it's a disappointment. Yeah. I'm not mad at it. I don't hate it. I just don't love it as much as I should have. Yeah. The middle child. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and th this is coming from the uh, person who's married to the, the, um, to a, a, a middle, a middle child. My wife is a middle child and she makes uh, every joke about being the middle child there, there can be. So shout out to my wife um sure um so what would what would you what what kind of grade would you give episode two brian i i give it a d i i it's passable but i i certainly wouldn't bring it home and, and ask for a reward i can understand that i can appreciate that yeah all right well we are coming up on our time so um Let's change it up and let Brian go first. Oh, yeah. Brian, All why don't right. you tell the people out there where they can find you at? Absolutely. Well, first off, I want to say again how much fun I'm having on this podcast. I really enjoy uh, talking to the audience, talking to you two guys. It's great to have a weekly sit down and just talk about Star Wars because ordinarily me talking about Star Wars is uh, an unwelcome conversation with a stranger in a restaurant. So it's much better to have it in more of a refined atmosphere. Uh, I post yep. as Darth Corosis on the Sith Library and Archives on Facebook. I'm old enough that Facebook is my main social media. Reach out to us there. It's an amazing collection of Sith-related humor, culture, art, discussion, all curated by some very careful and, and uh, loving members of the dark side. Now, when, uh, we do prefer our evil be fictional, but we do a good job of it. Yes. Uh, as for me, uh, you all guys right. can find okay. me. Yeah. What about yourself? Oh, yeah. sorry. I kind of jumped on that one. You guys can find me on Instagram and X at GKJ underscore publishing, where I uh, talk about my books, The Archives of a St. Grand. There's five books in that ongoing fantasy series. I also talk about my YouTube channel, GKJ Publishing, on which I have a show called The Right Way. Uh, and this Saturday, actually, is the season six finale. We are going to be doing the uh, second annual Writies Awards. Um, it's my own personal award show, and uh, I get to have some fun with it. I'm actually uh, for one of the awards since I'm a presenter for all three. I'm I uh, spoof Samuel L. Jackson, Mace Windu himself, by uh, doing my impersonation under the name of Jack L. Samuelson. He's probably going to kill me. Probably. Uh, as for us right here, of course, if you want to get a hold of us, uh, you can email us at warthestars1 at gmail.com. 
Our Instagram is at war underscore of underscore the underscore. Well, I got to read that again. War war underscore of the underscore stars one or uh, at world stars one on Twitter. Uh, our YouTube, you can go to at Star Wars at the SW Child, where you can check out my other show, Star Wars to the Eyes of a Child, where myself and my daughter are going through and watching Star Wars together. Um, uh, also, we are, of course, a part of Geek News Now. Go to Geek News Now on YouTube and Spotify for not only War the Stars, but also every other show, all a bunch of other shows, uh, the Geek Gauntlet, uh, the Sith Dominion. Um, I believe. What else do we have? Um, MCU Mondays, uh, just to name a few. Uh, oh, Kofi.com forward slash War of the Stars. If you want to support the show, or you can go to our uh, Spreadshirt.com forward slash Shop forward slash War of the Stars. to uh if you want to buy um our merch um quick um uh, note before we get out of here i will not be here next week i'm going to be going on another vacation um so <laughs> um everyone i know is going on vacation <laughs> like sand <laughs> uh so these two um gentlemen will be um taking the reins once again into their capable hands um so it should be a, a fun show tomorrow yeah, aren't, uh, next, or next week next week aren't we doing like a uh a uh a ask anything like a q a type of thing yes yes so this is your <laughs> chance uh send all the uh hate mail to uh uh garrett at um garrett at whitehouse.gov exactly uh but no <laughs> now seriously um you have all our social media there um send it to any of our social media pages uh we'll put stuff up um on uh instagram and uh all the other sites that we're on for questions Yes. Um, email it. Tweet it. Tweet X. What do they call? Is it called tweeting? Or is it? Uh, I don't. I don't know anymore. Like. I, uh, I, I just. It's. It. It seems so weird. Yeah. Uh, anyway, send us. Send us smoke signals if you. If you have to. Uh, um. You know, passenger pigeon. Um. I think Brian. Oh no, he didn't. I thought Brian froze up on us again. <laughs> Um, but we look forward to hearing still. from you guys. Um, hearing from you got all you guys out there. So until then, uh, for myself in two weeks, um, for these guys next week, remember this is not just my Star Wars, this is not just your Star Wars, this is our Star Wars. Until next time, may the force be with you. Morphing time it is. I can't follow that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hate sand. <laughs> <laughs>